Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, how do you keep your police force happy? Where do you cite your gun cabinet? Big calibers after big game, we're after Red Heart Beast in Namibia. But first, the other end of the scale, we're looking at accurate air gunning with that legend in his own underpants, Roy Lupton. Most people are introduced to shooting through air rifles. Many are then eager to step up onto proper rifles, but there is a lot to be said for endeavouring to master the art of one before moving on to a bigger bang. Roy has always been an airgun fan, but for a bit of an experiment, and more importantly to improve his accuracy, we are going to do some back of envelope calculations. Well, actually back of cardboard box. As I've not used an air rifle for quite some time, we thought it would be a good idea just to come out, have a bit of a play on a target. So we're going to put a series of dots on here um, and just figure out where we're shooting at different ranges because obviously with a sub 12 foot pound air rifle then the trajectory can be quite steep. 35 and then we shall do one at 50. So we'll just see where our, where our ranges are and exactly where the gun's shooting before we go out and uh, use it in anger. Roy has zeroed in at 25 yards, but will start at 10 and work backwards. A rangefinder is a vital piece of kit for this sort of work. It's essential if we want to find out just what happens to our pellets as they battle against gravity and the forces of nature. You're obviously trying to shoot headshots on a lot of animals, and so you've got a very small target area, so what you're trying to do is make sure you can be as precise as possible. So having a, a rangefinder really does enable you just to uh, with pinpoint accuracy figure out where you are and with the mill dots in the scope if you know where you are on your range then you can easily adjust up or down just with a little bit of hold over or hold under and you should be smack on the target and we'll send a pellet on the way like that so actually at 10 that's not too low at all so we'll just put another one in just to make sure and same hole so that's exactly what we should expect from an air rifle of this sort of quality so same whole grouping so we'll move back now to 25 and see where we go right okay so we are smack on 25 all focused in i should just put one up the chamber almost same position so we'll do it again and we're there again, so actually there's just a touch over to the left. At 35 yards, things start to get a bit more tricky and Roy has to compensate for drop-off with holdover and there's the gusting wind. So we're on 35 yards here and I'm just going to hit the record button. I would have expected we'll probably get maybe a mill dot drop on here, but we shall soon find out. So hit that on the target. There you go, actually mill dot and a half and yet we are slightly to the left on here shooting through. So we'll put another one down, see if we get the same result. Down there like that, so yeah the wind's interfering, so that one's a little bit further down as well. So we just have to, we've got to take into consideration that we have a bit of side wind. So what we would do now at 35 yards is if we were aiming directly at that target with no wind, we would put that mill dot straight on it at 35 yards and then we should be, st we should be straight onto it. But we've also got a little bit of windage as well. So with the windage what we're going to do is we're going to come across a mill dot across like that. So we're going to aim off the target like so and we'll just see if we can get anywhere near the, the target there. So what you saw on the shot there was perfect height so we'd adjusted up so we were absolutely spot on on line of where we wanted to be um, but obviously with the different wind strength it's going to always affect the pellet depending if you hit or if you shoot in a gust or in a lull in the wind so that's what you've always got to try and do if you are having to go out and you are shooting in the wind always be aware of it especially with an air rifle and then just make your compensations. At 50 the shot has dropped about 6 inches but a couple of shots with adjustment puts Roy bang on the money. You can see we've got a huge drop off on 50 being zeroed at 25 so uh, then we adjusted for it so we know where we need to be on that. 
came up here and then just adjusted for the windage and the height from that shot to there so we knew where we were another fine adjustment and we were smack on at the 50 yards so hopefully we know pretty much where we're going to be so with a clear picture of where that pellet is flying, it's time for an air gun safari. Roy's eccentric family home has a wide range of bird life from eagles to doves to peacocks. So there's plenty of food about for crows, pigeons, rabbits and squirrels. With the camera watching Roy's every move, we can analyse where he's putting the crosshairs and see just how the quarry reacts. OK, we got... The carrion crow just landed in the tree there. I reckon he's about 20 yards. Let's try. Oh, no way. That just parted his feathers by the looks of that. I want to go and have a look at that and replay. So uh, I think I just undercompensated where he was sitting high up in the tree there. Um, the shot looked like it just went straight over the top of his head and just skimmed it. Um, and I think that must have been down to the angle that I was shooting at. So I was aiming smack on, but the pellet went above. So I think I didn't compensate because we were shooting at quite a steep angle up. Uh, oh well, hopefully another one will come in. Okay, so about 40 yards. Oh, excellent. Okay. I want to have a look at that. Oh. He was just on about 45 yards. And you can see that. that and it just dropped, so I, I didn't quite allow enough. But with the angle of where the drop-off was coming, it was directly in line of where his neck was. So luckily it, uh, it took him out there. So uh, that was a nice clean kill. So he was done. All right, let's see if we can get a couple more. We've got a feral pigeon just sitting up here. We'll see if we can uh, put a few ferals in the bag, keep the ferrets going for a few days. So let's see if we can get him. He's about 20 yards, so that should be aiming smack on. OK, just wait for his head to come round. And... Yep, OK, perfect. Excellent. Right, any more? No, nothing there at the minute. But the reason we're shooting the ferals is we've got quite a big population of white doves here. And with the white doves, obviously, they attract in a lot of other pigeons. So uh, when they come in, they can bring disease and whatever else in. So we're, we're constantly trimming the, uh, the feral pigeons and what have you as they come in. And we also trim up the white doves as well because we, uh, we end up with a flock of about two or 300 come the winter otherwise. So it's, uh, it's always a good source of food for the ferrets and whatever else through the season. So when we get the opportunity to pop a few off, we certainly take it. This is a shot that we, we had a bit earlier and it was a, a miss on a rabbit. I just want to see exactly what happened. I'm presuming I must have shot over the top. So uh, that's the wonderful thing with this camera. It just shows you your mistakes and where you went wrong. So hopefully we can see the muzzle go in a second. Look, wow, look at that. That is phenomenal. You actually see the pellet just arcing over the top of his head and him ducking down. I don't know whether he saw that coming or just felt it. I think he probably just felt it as it went over his, uh, his head. Um, but it, again, that really just highlights how effective you've got to be on your range finding. So you've got to, you've got to really sort of either take a range finder out with you or, or, or be as good as, and as accurate as you can in guessing your ranges. So it's probably worth going out and trying beforehand um, because that, was, that rabbit was, I think, 35 yards. Um, and I'd allowed for a 40 yard shot. So uh, I was just aimed a little bit too far above his ears. This was a rabbit shot by a young friend of mine, Jordan. And, uh, and it really does demonstrate how bad the windage can be or your windage adjustment needs to be, as we showed when we were shooting at the target. So when the pellet goes, you can see it's taken by the wind. So on this shot, we've got a left to right wind 
and you can see it taking the shot or taking the pellet right over and rather than hitting on the, in the head of the rabbit it goes in and uh, hits it square in the chest. So still a, a very good um, kill shot but not the one he was after. So you could see he'd already come forward so he'd come forward to allow for the windage but just not quite enough and uh, luckily the, the pellet still found its mark. We've had some success but Roy is not overly happy. He thinks that some fine tuning could improve his accuracy. One of the problems has been changing the magnification on the scope. This has been putting the mill dots out, which means the adjustments he's making are not precise. He also wants to re-zero at 35 yards and work through the ranges again. He believes this will deliver a flatter trajectory, which means less time worrying about compensating for the shot in the field. That's about right, so level-wise we're just a touch off, but that's okay. And spot on. Okay. So we're now at 20 yards. Just make sure we're on, see where it's going at 20, give us some sort of idea. Just to make sure, always take a couple of shots. Yeah, that one, we're just exactly one mil dot high there. On to the 40. And again, the wind's just taking a little bit there. On to the 50 dot. It seems to be more in line, but the wind stopped there. We didn't get any windage issues. So this is out to 60. And we'll see how much more drop away we get just with that extra 10 yards. So let's now look at the complete picture for four different scenarios. 2-2 two, two, zeroed at 25 yards there. And we've got a huge curve off and drop off like that. So from the very start all the way through we were just trying to catch our tails all the time but the pellet from the, the moment it was leaving the barrel was curving away from us. With a 2-2 zeroed at 35 yards. Excuse my writing it's awful and you can see here we started off at 10 so we're a little bit high at 10 and then we've got the curve going up over round dropping off and then really dropping away there. So this is 2-2 zeroed at 30 yards, okay, so slightly low at 10, but not, not enough off to really matter, and then we go just up a little bit to 20, through 30, perfectly, and drop down to 50, so that's almost a more usable curve of the trajectory on there. And then, just to show the differences, what we've got here is we shot the same target, the same ranges, with a 177, so we've got 177, Okay, that was zeroed at 40 yards, okay. And then you can see here, spot on at 10, a little bit high at 20, still rising to 30, smack on at 40, down through to 50, okay. So it was dropping off there, but for, throughout the range of 10 to 40, a much better trajectory. Interesting stuff, and with this in mind, Roy chooses to zero at 30 and head off after some more bunnies. The first is at 30 yards, so in theory should be spot on. Even though it takes some grass seeds with it, the pellet finds its target exactly where the crosshairs came to rest. The second rabbit Roy has since described as a ninja. This shot is at 17 yards. Again, remembering we are zeroed at 30, Roy puts the crosshairs level with the eye. He expects the pellet to be rising, so we'll find the target between the center and the first mill dot. However, this rabbit has other ideas and it ducks. Not in response to a low-flying object soaring over his head, but just before the pellet reaches its target. Slowing the shot down further, it clearly shows the ear being clipped. Did it hear the shot? Did it see the pellet? You tell us. Whatever you think, it's a great excuse if you miss. Lots of our air gunning videos if you look at the screen that's appearing over my left shoulder. Now it's off to David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. The first £100 plus carp has been caught by an Austrian angler in Hungary. Roman Hank caught the mirror carp earlier this month at the Euro Aqua Fishery, which costs 700 euros a week to fish. 
The previous record was jointly held by Brits Ambrose Smith and John Bryan with a 99-pound fish from Le Graviere Fishery in Dijon, France. The new record fell for a bird food boilie. The Countryside Alliance has published The Case for Hunting. Four years ago it produced The Case for Repeal, but has not until now produced a single concise document on the positives for hunting. It's now filled the gap. Download it from countrysidealliance.org. Pacific bluefin tuna caught off the Californian coast have been found to have radioactive traces from last year's nuclear disaster at Fukushima. The bluefin tuna breeds and spends its first couple of years off Japan before swimming to the California coast. Yellowfin tuna, which tend to stay put around the California coast, are not radioactive. Scientists say there's no danger from eating Californian bluefins. Once upon a time, there were eagles soaring all over our British countryside. New research in the journal Bird Study uses place names to show the distribution of both golden and sea eagles during the Dark Ages. Village names beginning in A-N or A-R-N mean eagle, so they believe places such as Adlington and Arden were home to these great birds. Of course, an RSPB spokeswoman quickly blamed gamekeepers for the birds' decline. Clips from the Jeremy Wade series on big game fishing are now on YouTube. Visit the Animal Planet TV channel to see films such as this one about shark fishing for the Requiem Whaler Shark. And finally, a nasty story about a rogue kangaroo who stalked a woman for two days and then attacked her. Australian housewife Kiralee McWilliams was confronted in her own backyard by a growling female eastern grey kangaroo. The usually placid animal attacked her in a driveway the following afternoon. It ran towards her at high speed. She sustained a foot-long gash and other scratches. The local wildlife service has hired a shooter and issued a permit to destroy the animal. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Now, where do you cite your gun cabinet? We ask the experts at Browning. Andy Norris is looking for a good place to cite his new gun cabinet. So we need to find somewhere we can place our cabinet that's going to be out of sight, out of mind and safe as houses. We can't keep it outside on an external wall where it's going to be visible and easy to access. We don't want to keep it in a, an outbuilding that also is going to be easy to get into, i.e. a barn. So we need to keep it indoors where it's also warm and we can keep an eye on it and it's looked after by household security. You can't put it on the stud wall because you can get something behind, jemmy it off and you've got nowhere to fix it to. So what we're looking for here Neville is a solid indoor internal wall that we can fix this cabinet to that the raw bolts are really going to be able to do their duty and lock in there nice and solid not easy to gain access to. Well, that's jolly clear. Clever Andy Norris. Or should that be Clever Browning? Next, let's take those guns out of the gun cabinet and take them big game hunting in Africa. What kind of African hunting lodge does not have a show-off collection of mounts? There can be good ones and bad ones. This giraffe is quite special. It's in the Blaza Safari's catalogue and Blaza is often contacted by people asking for more details about how it is mounted. Of course it takes a lot of hard work to get to this from this. We want to go out with Spanish hunter Alejandro as he looks for a red hartebeest, one of the largest antelope in Namibia. First, he has to get to grips with big game calibers on the range. Ammunition supplied by Norma, rifles by Blaza, optics by Zeiss. <laughs> Stefan Buring from Carl Zeiss is Alejandro's host in Namibia and he explains what the hunter is using. In this specific scope we have a very uh, unique new lens design which was uh, developed by our sister company SHOT and uh, which just gives us a less extra percentage up to 95% of light transmission. So um, that's especially for the very early morning hours or for the late uh, evening hours that gives you another 5% compared to other scopes. As usual with big game hunting nothing happens easily but then at last it all starts to go right. 
Was the shot good? Alejandro is not sure. He walks up to where he hopes he will find the animal, and there it is. Veo muy rápido. El solo me ha dado una acción. Ha sido que me ha me ha puesto el trípode. Cuando me cuando me ha puesto el trípode, solo podía tirarlo en una posición y solamente allí solo había esa oportunidad. Solo me ha dado dos segundos el animal para poder, porque en los dos segundos si no lo tiro se se hubiera ido. Alejandro's wife and fellow hunter Patricia is soon on the scene and they have an emotional reunion. Jorgen is also happy, but mainly about the performance of his ammunition. The design behind the Norix bullet is that it's bonded, which means it, it will retain a lot of weight and uh, it will also uh, penetrate very deep and crush bone. And uh, also the, the bonding makes it very strong so it doesn't disintegrate when it, when it goes through and especially on, on heavier game like African larger antelopes and uh, moose. It's important that you have a bullet that really penetrates deep enough to, to, to reach the vital organs like the heart and the lungs. The process is not over. The carcass has to come back to the lodge to be skinned and butchered. This gives Jürgen a chance to look for the bullet. It has mushroomed to a very large mushroom and it has penetrated right through the animal and we found it on the skin side. How much of the bullet is left inside the animal? Very little. Since this bullet is bonded, uh, most of the, the lead and uh, all of the, the jacket is, is bonded together. And this means uh, we have a very high weight retention. Now we are heading for that heady moment when Alejandro will be able to admire the head on his wall. Here in the cutting room, the meat goes one way and the hide or head or both go the other into the salting room for drying. He's had a good hunt. He's had a hard hunt. He's got his trophy. Now comes one of the most important parts of this whole process is dealing with this animal. It comes into the skinning shed. It gets offloaded as soon as possible. It gets, depending on what the client wants, it gets uh, cut up into a flat skin or a cape or whatever the case may be. The skinners and the trackers do the skinning and, and the heads are cleaned off. The skins are brought here they get put into salt, they get spread out, layer of salt at the bottom, they get salted very well for a couple of days and... Uh, what does that do? That ensures that there's no decomposition or, or minimises decomposition and... and kills the bugs. Kills the bugs. Trophies are not super fashionable in the UK these days, but they are a fantastic way of celebrating your African adventure. That's what he takes back with him. The, the memories and, and, you know, years after he's, he's, he's come to Namibia and hunted this animal that, and he's got this trophy hanging up in the wall, that, that's actually what he, what he retains of this whole experience. Call them a souvenir if you like. They are a long way up the scale from a straw hat or a wooden giraffe. This red hearted beast will take pride of place as a mount in Alejandro's house. So that's what we've been doing. Let's have a look at the rest of what the hunting and shooting and fishing community on YouTube has been up to. It's Hunting YouTube. Roebuck, coke cans, rats, rabbits, pretend wild boar and a new use for an old oil filter. They're all on Hunting YouTube this week, which aims to show the best hunting, shooting and fishing videos that YouTube has to offer. Thanks to everyone who has sent in their favourite films. Yorkshire Rose Stalking continues his epic series on bucks that can no longer be seen in Yorkshire. This one called Trevor's First Outing shows a buck succumbing to a 6.5 by 55. Viewer Tristan Ball says of this video, it is, I'm afraid, all in French, but some of the shots are quite fun. Uploaded by Celadang, it shows kids going roebuck stalking in France. Some of the shots are a bit dodgy. That terrier is clearly untrained and I should know. And stone me if they don't celebrate a successful shot by kissing each other in most un-British fashion. But Tristan is right. It's quite fun. Coming from a world where there's no such thing as an ordinary roebuck, Team Wild Hunting is after monster roebucks in Hungary. The hunt is, as usual, awesome. When is it not? A couple of weeks ago, we showed you a film about you 
YouTube gamers putting down their pretend AK-47s and picking up proper Brownings to try out clay pigeon shooting. We explained how they were becoming famous on YouTube for showing film from video games such as Modern Warfare while talking about their girlfriends and their exams. Well, now there's a spotty continental lad called Flabbergasting Me doing the same over footage from a video game called The Hunter. Dear me, it's just not healthy. In this film, ASA 37mm and his mate Tom test the Econo Can on pistols, rifles and full autos. What is the Econo Can? It's one of those mad ideas that land on the gun trade from time to time, a threaded attachment that allows you to improvise a moderator out of a car's oil filter. Oh yes. The thing is, as this video shows, it really works. Neil Hawkins, who sent in the video, says, I'm not sure my local firearms liaison officer would agree. Lots of people hated our test splat special series, but a handful of you clearly loved it. Here's a tribute act by Jim Barboy 1985 showing in fabulous slow-mo a CZ22 rimfire, thumbhole laminated stock with moderator plus Winchester Super X22 LR40GR subsonic hollow point ammunition shooting lemonade, coke, tomato, milk and apples, all set to Beethoven's piano sonata number no. 8 in C minor, known as test splat special haters doubtless already know as the pathetic. What says rabbit shooting on YouTube these days more than the mellifluous Northern Irish tones of Hunter's Vermin? In this film, Rabbit Hunt number no. 29, things don't go as planned as he messes up a long range shot and is lucky to pull off a good second shot to finish the job properly. Diggers and Dogs, that's how to go ratting as this film by AJJ0700 from January 2010 shows. It has had a quarter of a million views in that time, showing the enduring popularity of rats as a sporting quarry. Dutch viewer Rijk van der Vaarte suggests it for hunting YouTube with the message, keep up the good work guys, we love your stuff in Holland. You're all right, Rijk. You can click on any of these films to watch them if you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. If you enjoyed our show this week, you might enjoy The Shooting Show. You'll see a clip of it in the sky above my left shoulder just there. Or you can subscribe to us on YouTube or go to our show's page, which is at www.youtube.com slash show slash fieldsportsbritain. Or indeed our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you'll find a link to our Facebook page where you can like us, or our Twitter page where you can follow us, or best of all, scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see our constant contact box, pop your email address into that, and we'll contact you. This has been Field Sports Britain.